And, and today we will be talking about something you may not immediately associate with technology and artificial intelligence specifically, which is intimacy. My name is Mona Sloan. My pronouns are she, her. I identify as a white woman. I have short brown hair cut into a bob, um, see-through um, acrylic glasses, and I have a picture in the background uh, on a white wall. I am a sociologist here at New York University. I work on inequality in the context of artificial intelligence, um, design, but also policy. I am a fellow at the Institute for Public Knowledge and also a senior research scientist at NYU's new Center for Responsible AI, which is hosted at the Tannen School of Engineering, where I also teach social science to engineers. Um, and I also am the convener and founder of the Co-opting AI series, as well as the, the shift series and I have the absolute pleasure of serving as public books technology editor. Now this series would not be possible without the generous support and sponsorship of the Institute for Public Knowledge, which is, which is led by Eric Kleinenberg and Jessica Coffey and a wonderful team who make all of this happen behind the scenes, as well as Ellen Toscano at the 370J Project and the NYU Center for Responsible AI, which is led by Julia Stojanovic and Steven. Kuyan. Now, before I introduce my wonderful guests tonight and say a few words to frame the conversation about intimacy, I want to acknowledge that by being in New York City, I'm standing on the unceded land of the Lanapi peoples. And I ask you in joining me in acknowledging the Lanapi community and the indigenous communities on whose land you are currently standing and to commit to beginning the process of working to dismantle the ongoing legacies of settler colonialism. I also want to express my commitment to the Black Lives Matter movement and the ongoing project to take a white privilege and systemic racism and to develop an anti-racist culture in our communities and institutions, but also particularly in the academy. Now, as this week is the first anniversary of the first lockdown here in New York City, I want to again and again thank the essential workers who have kept us safe for over a year. Thinking back to May 2020, I remember the city erupting in cheers and applause at the daily change of shift of healthcare workers at 7 p.m. And I remember that through the pain and collective trauma, there was really a genuine and intense moment of connection and of intimacy, I would say. Now, those of you who have been to co-opting AI events before not know that I like to take these introductions as an opportunity to give a shout out to people who I think deserve one. And today, in line with our topic, I want to express my gratitude for all those unpaid care workers who keep our society afloat. The burden of care work is unevenly distributed. In 2018, the International Labor Organization reported that the 16 billion hours spent on unpaid caring every day would represent nearly a tenth of the world's entire economic output if it was paid at a fair rate. Now, this work is rarely accounted for in calculations of gross domestic product, but if it were, women's unpaid contributions to healthcare alone equate to 2.35% of the global GDP, which is the equivalent of 1.4 trillion US dollars. We all know that the COVID-19 pandemic has exacerbated the situation and that women and girls are dis disproportionately affected by this, particularly those who also experience disadvantage on the basis of income, race, geographic location, migration status, disability, sexual orientation, and health status. How do we square that as well as the intimate connections that make up care work and that already exist in and through technology with really the growing prevalence of artificial intelligence in our lives? And this is really what we're gonna be exploring today. Our conversation will focus on the topics of agency, care, connectedness, sexuality, humanness and non-humanness, as well as equity and inequity and on how, how our intimate lives are mediated by, by AI and vice versa. 
Now, please join me in welcoming my distinguished panelists today, Gabriela Garcia and Hannah Zeven. Starting us off will be Gabriela, who is a writer, performer, and poetic technologist. Her research primarily focuses on the protection of radical self-expression, networked subcultures, and cybernetic intimacy. As a performance artist, Gabriella works to create spaces ruled by vulnerability. She has performed and work curated by New York Restoration Project in partnership with the Brooklyn Academy of Music, the Watermill Center, Spring Break Art Show, Mana Contemporary, and Ocean Front Studio. Her work has appeared at Culture Hub, Pioneer Works, Museum of Sex, and the secret project Robot. Gabriela is currently working on the creation of Decoding Stigma, a cross-institutional thinking group bridging the gap between sex workers, academics, and technologists. She is the managing editor of adjacent NYU's, NYU ITP's online journal of emerging media. Gabriela will be followed by Hannah Zeven, who is a lecturer in the Department of English and History at UC Berkeley and a faculty affiliate at the University of California at Berkeley Center for Science, Technology, Medicine, and Society. Her research focuses on the coordinated histories of technology and medicine. Hannah is the author of The Distance Cure, A History of Telepathy, which is forthcoming with MIT Press in August. Um, and she's actually working on her second book, as you do, um, which is called Mother's Little Helper is Technology in the American Family, also with MIT Press in 2023. Other work has appeared or is forthcoming in a journal of feminist cultural studies, Logic Magazines, the Los Angeles Review of Books, Slate, and many more. A very warm welcome to both of you. Thank you so much for joining the conversation tonight. A few words about housekeeping. Now, we will hear from each of our panelists for about 10 to 15 minutes. In the meantime, please, whenever a question pops into your head, pop it in the Q&A section. We'll be collecting those and I'll be asking those questions later. Um, while um, we are talking, we will, we're fortunate enough to have closed captions uh, today. We are recording this event and we'll be putting it on the IPK YouTube channel later. Now, without further ado, please let me hand over to Gabriella and thank you so much both for joining us tonight. Thank you so much, Mona. All right, I'm going to share my screen and hopefully do it smoothly and successfully after so much practice in um, this remoteness that we are experiencing right now. Um, so yes, I am Gabriella Garcia. Um, I do a lot of things and I'll contextualize a bit of that now. I, I care, everything I do uh, centers around ideas of bodily autonomy, subversive networks, radical self-expression and cybernetic intimacy as Mona uh, presented. And I do it through performance, writing, poetic technology and currently as a research resident uh, at NYU's interactive telecommunications program. So a little context in my background uh, in performance, um, everything I do is confrontational, but not in the Artodian theater of cruelty sort of way, but rather confronting myself publicly and in, in doing so by performing something that uh, even scares me to do, I hope to make space for others to feel safe. Uh, to confront and express their own fears. So this looks like um, Paradermis, which was a speculative fiction piece with Samantha CC uh, that looked at the, a future where we have weather control body suits uh, that either allow us or to or keep us from relating to each other, depending on how our weather patterns intersect. Um, Penance's poetry on the right explored uh, a performance around recorded conversations that I had with priests um, about different subversive sexual practices. And at the bottom is a documentation from a work I did with Lee May. Uh, it was a durational performance uh, in the context of a contemporary Bouteau. Um, and Lee May is a made up word that's based on a Japanese term, meaning the moment of change. 
um, or the moment of breaking through. So I like to think about it as like a pin that's about to break through the surface of a water balloon. Um, in writing, uh, my, my focus is on technology and intimacy and how it relates to each other, much like what we're talking about today, um, and different ways of relating to non-humanists. So I interviewed the um, uh, Initiative for Indigenous Futures in Montreal at Concordia University, University uh, which is co-founded by Jason Edward Lewis and Suzanne Kite. And they're looking at indigenous protocols that can inform more ethical production of technology, especially in the realm of artificial intelligence. Um, I interview people um, like Moon Rebus, who had an implant in her elbow, which related um, seismic activity on the earth, and that would inform her dance practice. So literally speaking to the planetary existence through technology in order to express artistically. Um, and currently I am working on decoding stigma, so we'll get back to this a little later, but thinking about how um, erotic labor has been part of this co-constitutive history of telecommunications. Um, so as a managing editor over at Adjacent, the, the last two issues uh, have both been very intim uh, intimacy related. So issue seven was about feeling um, and this, this article, please leave uh, your robot cat in uh, in the Will by Sid Lowe was discussing the, the way that we should have a little bit more of care for these care objects uh, that appear in, in our life. And um, Disembodiment Issues 8 comes out in April. So uh, shameless plug, please um, check it out. There are so many beautiful articles about um, how BDSM practices can teach us uh, how to heal ourselves from this uh, techno dystopic future that we view artificial intelligence through, um, how we can bring humanity back into uh, the data tracking of uh, COVID trauma. Um, so it really does come to the forefront of everything that I put out in the world. Um, as a poetic technologist, I love to create projects that uh, ask us to confront others um, and ourselves and other ourselves in order to confront the ones in others. So this is um, a Python generator that uh, is called a prayer for bad situations. And it was it used data scraping um, and APIs to uh, create a meditation um, that tried to put you in the place of a difficult, a, a difficult person in a difficult position in order to try to better understand what it might look like in the world to be in their shoes. Um, and this was generated out the idea that like, like a passionate affair with the other as our other half might be the key to our survival as a species recognizing that being each other's other is the one thing we have in common. Um, also in poetic technology, this was a, a, scent, a smell situated data set called the Greenest Block in Brooklyn 2019. And essentially I made a perfume that documented all of the, the flora that had been part of this Greenest Block and uh, which was on Lincoln Place in Crown Heights between Ostrand Avenue and St. John's. Um, and it was to subvert the idea of data as a purely observational object. What does interpersonal data look like? How can collected data connect place and narrative and memory and become uh, an archive and an object that can be shared um, as a point of intimacy um, as a, an heirloom object? So I was asked to provide provocations for this discussion, and I thought that I would do it through two different projects. Um, as a caveat, I am not an AI researcher. Um, and so for those in the audience who are, please take this as an opportunity to hear an outsider's perspective coming from a world of speculative futurism 
uh, approach through design and incubation toward practical application. And forgive me for any of my mistakes in AI understanding. So the first, uh, what does it mean to train artificial neural networks in a society that shames us about our natural occurring erotic neural networks? Um, and this is a question I want to uh, explore through a project called Virtuoso, uh, which I made in spring of 2019. And it was a vibrator, it is a vibrator that rewards you for making art. So essentially it would charge to the amount of time that you would spend in an application that tracked how much art you were making, and then you were able to utilize it based on, on that behavior. Or you could actually be rewarded as you make art, which is how we presented it in the spring show at ITP. Um, and so the, the pleasure principle was by aligning the body's built-in reward system with making art, creative, creativity becomes a pleasure activity with an internalized incentive. And it was a reclamation of data and self-tracking um, in response to this idea that, you know, we have, we've reached this peak self-development culture uh, with like $10 billion uh, self-improvement market telling us how to recognize, listen to, and exploit our embodied cognition toward cultivating an ideal self. Um, and despite sexuality being the drive of existence, it rarely enters the self-improvement conversation. Uh, and this is through an extraordinary effort to sever sexuality from the body by pathologizing, medicalizing, and moralizing it away. But what if you can strip society away and investigate uh, the personally experienced sexuality for what it is, which is a reward focused um, cognitive sensor of our auton autonomic nervous uh, system. Um, so it was built to challenge that stigma and to honor the sexual response system for the purpose of creation with the intention of prioritizing art. Uh, the quote was breed ideas, not and babies. Um, so, you know, the values that we tried to promote was that this was for everybody. Um, that sexuality does not equate obscenity, that pleasure is a universal right, and that art is mandatory for humankind as much as having um, children is mandatory. Um, unsurprisingly, this project ended up at the back of the um, spring show that year, um, which is because we still live in a world in which tech that promotes autonomous exploration of sexuality is considered obscene while it remains acceptable to exploit those who labor in sex industries for tech design by and for men. So this is an example of a, a vibrator that was created by, on the left, uh, Laura DiCarlo, and it initially won the Robotics Innovation Award at the Consumer Electronics Show. Um, and this was done with the engineering department, I think at Oregon State University. Um, correct me if I'm wrong in the future, but it was banned after winning the um, award for being obscene. Yet at the same conference that year, um, there was this augmented reality app that had no issue. Um, it never got banned, it was never questioned, created by Naughty America. Um, so what is this, right? Like, why, why, so like, I need to come back to the provocation, like, what does it mean to train artificial neural networks in a society that shames us about our naturally occurring erotic neural networks? Us being those who want to hold autonomy over our bodies and learn the intelligence and capabilities uh, held within, ex accessed through the erotic. And us being those who are told that the erotic is only to be explored through domination exploitation. A uh, second provocation from this is uh, what would happen if we started training AI through the lens of independent erotic intimacy first? Uh, I won't go further on this one because it's kind of a, it's a gestational phase for me still. So I just wanted to put that out there for discussion. And my second provocation, or I guess third technically, uh, coming from a second project is um, what can technology learn from sex workers? So yeah, I told you we'd get back to this. Uh, this is an article that we wrote on the subject. I wrote in conjunction with Zara Stardust over at Brooklyn Klein Center at Harvard. 
and Chibundo um, Eguatu, who is at UI, University of Illinois, uh, Anthropology Department um, at Champaign-Urbana. And it's a, an article that kind of looks at this project that we are all a part of called Decoding Stigma, which is this cross-institutional coalition working to prioritize sexual autonomy as a necessary ethics question for futurists. This is developed from an understanding that as Melissa Jarrett Grant says, um, all sexual commerce is technological. And we want to continue to explore the historically co-constitutive relationship between sexual labor and the development of digital media, which has looked like, we trace this all the way back to the beginnings of mass media and telecommunications. Uh, erotic material fiscally supported the emergence of photography uh, experienced by the paying public in the form of stereoscopic porn and peep shows as early as the 1800s. Uh, the term call girl comes from the fact that high-end brothels were some of the first urban institutions to install telephones. Uh, this video is blocked because of content <laughs> issues, so you can't see it, but it was essentially a, a video about uh, teaching you how to uh, have cyber sex that was uh, published in the mid 1990s. Um, and that's so I guess I'll have you Google that how to have cyber sex on the internet 1990s, you will find it. Um, but erot the erotic market of the 1980s proto internet bulletin board systems literally paid for the material infrastructure that paved the path toward the World Wide Web. And weaving with video game development, uh, it pushed demand for better computer graphics, faster processing speeds, greater data bandwidths uh, that, made, that were necessary to make internet ubiquity uh, even a remote possibility uh, before mainstream consumer adoption could even be taken into consideration. Um, how much time do I have? <laughs> Until you're done. Okay, fantastic. So, oops, there we go. Um, sex workers were also some of the first to invest in encrypted payment processors. Um, this is Jennifer Ringley, also known as Jenny Cam. Um, she was not necessarily a, uh, a sex worker or identifying as sex trade, but um, she was one of the first to use encrypted payment platform um, to access content. So PayPal, Stripe, Square Cash, like all of that was started with the ability to access erotic content on the internet. And then in the 1990s, urban gentrification efforts uh, that were used to sort of uh, sweep vice under, you know, under the rug, uh, street-based sex workers actually migrated online to join this territory that was established by uh, those who were already working in the erotic industry on the internet. Um, and with this, there became an entire um, network subculture of uh, whisper networks uh, that created digital catalogs of abusive clients um, uh, and experiences of violences at the hand of law enforcement um, advocates for the decriminal decriminalization of sex work, uh, organized digital platforms that offered legal, medical, and harm reduction resources. Um, so in this way, you could see how um, not only did uh, erotic trade facilitate, fiscally facilitate the infrastructure, the infrastructure ended up facilitating um, safety for a community that has otherwise be, been morally shunned despite being sort of on the forefront of intimate encounter. Yet we kind of live in this world, uh, you know, it's called whorephobia um, um, and it's really embedded in tech design. And it's it, like, we live in a present in which technology is explicitly built to target and eliminate sex work in development. And the input and experience of sex workers has essentially been exploited. And this looks like the erasure and deplatforming of sex workers on social media platforms and financial tech services, the same encrypted financial tech services that they had actually promoted. Um, so posting into the void is uh, a sex worker led community report 
uh, from Hacking Hustling, who I highly recommend that you check out for many kind of tech related intimacy reports. Um, and it was to gain an understanding of the ways that platforms responded to uh, Section 230 carve outs that were kind of promoted through this anti sex work core phobic legislation. Um, and the impact of content moderation and the threatened threats to free speech and human rights. And it looks like how those who may have been identified by certain algorithms as being involved in sex work and also identified by algorithms as being involved in um, activism and uh, such as Black Lives Matter movements were regularly deplatformed. So how does this sort of erasure due to stigmatization actually impact the ability to organize around some of the most marginalized and necessary um, issues that we are dealing with that are, you know, as Mona said in her wonderful introduction, um, the things that we have to acknowledge and, and, and fix and make better. Um, sex work stigma has been used to justify research and funding for surveillance technology that ultimately profiles and further harms at-risk communities. Um, so is this actually going? Yes, okay. So this is actually stand for a deep dive project that bragged about uh, using image scraping to obtain what more than 30 million advertisements for sex work from online sources. This is, you know, without consent. Um, and it, Stanford was very proud of the fact that they did this. Um, so if a consenting sex worker has posted any identifying photo online, it's guaranteed that that photo and any connected information in this, you know, surveillance economy dragnet that we currently exist within uh, has been scraped into AI facial recognition models and likely classified as criminal, um, uh, as obscene. I'm going to skip this for now. So essentially, it's, you know, to big tech, the sex worker is as indispensable as they are disposable. So while fiscally supporting infrastructure of the internet and justifying research for anti-sex worker surveillance, um, they are, you know, supporting the same technology that in inevitably works against them. Um, so I also like to say that this is big tech is big pimping. So to come back to the provocation, what can tech learn from sex workers who have been at the forefront of both sides of this, both the creation and then the disruption caused? What if instead of being violently censored, sex workers were celebrated and platformed for the enormous amount of creative capital that they have generated for the output of consumer level technology? So at Decoding Stigma, we are, we're trying to figure that out right now. Um, and so some of the events that we threw last uh, semester, we'll call it, uh, was a trademark transparency um, workshop. And it was learning how to use the trademark electronic search system to find trademark disclosures and take action against surveillance technology development that threatens the privacy, safety, and livelihoods of sexually marginalized and other at-risk communities. We had another um, event in December called Freedom to Fucking Dream, and that was a workshop for sex workers and allies to radically imagine alternate futures for technology. Uh, the second um, event was facilitated by the Oracle for Trans Feminist Technologies, designed by Sasha Constanza Schock at MIT Co-Design Lab and Joana Varon at The Coding Rights in Brazil. And it was formulated as a healing aftercare event after the International Day to End Violence Against Sex Workers on December 8th, 17th, because so much of the work online um, in this movement is crisis oriented. And we wanted to instead create a space to joyfully world build, to nourish, to celebrate the radical network of laborers, accomplices, that are endeavoring to dismantle tech facilitated imperialist ideologies, which ends up helping everybody. If you're at the most marginalized, it only goes upwards from there. So this is what happens when we bridge the gap between sex workers, tech and academic research. It's 
it's a lot. Like this is one side of many of brainstorming of like everything that the coding stigma wants to do. It looks like digital hygiene and cybersecurity. It looks like demystification of new technology, open source resource sharing, consent-based communication, skill shares, collaboration. I mean, I could go on all day, which is why I will shamelessly plug a continuation of this conversation um, in April. Uh, this is the informal, criminalized, and precarious sex workers organizing against barriers. And it's a webinar series that will run daily between April 3rd and 17th, uh, organized by and for sex workers, uh, which will be covering much of what I just talked about and, and so much more. It's been, it's facilitated by the Disabled Sex Workers Coalition, Hacking Hustling, Cornell Law School uh, Gender and Justice Clinic, the Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society, and the Center for Information Technology and Public Life at University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. So it's it's a big conversation, and I think um, I'm very happy to be here to just like introduce it. Um, with that in mind, this is how you can reach it, me. Uh, screen capture it now before I hand over to Hannah. And sorry if I went over time. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Gabriella, and thanks for everybody who has already put questions into the Q&A uh, chat. I'll be collecting those and ask them as we delve into um, the conversation. Hannah, over to you. Thank you so much, and thank you so much, Gabriella. I was taking furious notes, just so excited to get past my own talk so that we can talk more about your work. Um, so uh, my provocation is just going to be in one piece, starting more generally, what is intimacy, moving into some of my own research on intimacy at a distance. Um, so my contact is here uh, for the screen capture. Uh, thank you so much to Mona and Zari and IPK for hosting. I'm imagining we're all on the fifth floor uh, in Cooper Square, alas. Um, and it's so lovely to meet you, Gabrielle, and hear so much more about your work. It's been so generative already. Intimacy has two standard senses in English. The one we might most commonly use for closely acquainted or very familiar people, intimates, and as euphemism for centuries now for sex and erotic relations, as in intimate relations, which Gabriella has just presented uh, so holistically and beautifully on. In both senses, intimacy is thought of as proceeding from relation. Intimacy occurs between, at the smallest of scales, the per se, to the largest sets, the crowd, the nation, and beyond borders. It is a mode of interaction that carries with it, perhaps obligation, expectation, but certainly feeling. Mass intimacy is not, as it were, a contradiction in terms, nor is immediate intimacy redundant. But intimacy occurs too between a person and themselves. Intimacy can be carried out on one's own to become self-intimate. And finally, intimacy can be a quality that is inmost, intrinsic. Something can be intimate because it's internal. Intimacy asks us to go after it, to locate it, not just where we feel it, but in what mode. But this definition so far constructs intimacy as a human to human feeling structure and immediately flattens those humans into a fungible equivalence, calling them by the same name. Yet two intimates do not somehow undo power and difference by their familiarity as power and difference are never located just inside the individual. As Fred Moden writes of friendship, just one of many forms of intimate feeling, quote, Friendship is what survives knowing each other. Friendship comes before knowing one another and it survives knowing one another. It survives the rules of individuation that incarcerates the differences that actually make friendship possible. It anticipates and survives individuation, end quote. Or we could say otherwise, friendship survives intimacy. Intimacy is thought of as a positive human value, much like the terms care and empathy often go uninterrogated. But that assertion that intimacy is a proper and dear form of relating negates what intimacy can conceal and carry, or perhaps what is always true about being made familiar, rendered as such. Intimacy is a, at first an action as opposed to an achieved state. 
The state of being intimate follows the action of making something intimate, making it familiar, making us familiar, however unevenly. Sometimes we think, fantasize, and presume intimacy when it's not there, but proceed as if it is. Sometimes intimacy is present and we do not detect it until well after it's been acted on and it's too late. Sometimes intimacy is short-term, a form of paid attention, rule-based and bounded, and then those boundaries are violated, sometimes not. When intimacy is covert or coercive, when it is unwelcome, even just a little bit, it can be immediately experienced as monstrous. And it can be worse than monstrous too. What does intimacy instruct? Following Denise De Silva, we might ask, what kinds of entanglements produce and result from intimacy? When are we made in that coerced way, familiar, whether via play or love or surveillance, capture or control? Wherever that occurs, we need to complicate how we think intimacy as a mode of interaction. Proximity and knowledge do imply intimacy, but they do not imply trust or consent. Humans are not, of course, only intimate with other humans, nor just with themselves. We have this form of familiarity with architectures, geographies, our machines, and perhaps equally importantly, places and spaces and tools have intimacy with us. Today, we're here to think about intimacy and AI, and perhaps less explicitly, intimacy at distance, remote intimacy, algorithmic intimacy, of course, and how they relate to care and connection and their undermining. Here's my, to borrow Gabriella's term, shameless plug. In my own work on remote intimacy, or what I call genres of distanced intimacy, which I discuss at length in my forthcoming book, The Distance Cure, A History of Teletherapy, I take up the intimate relation between therapist and patient working together over distance for the last 100 years. I look at the thing we now call teletherapy, which feels you know, constant and ever presence, uh, presenced in our uh, COVID-19 landscape. Tele there does a lot of work, as does the notion of remote or distance. While distance is often taken to be the sign of intimacy interrupted or the site of producing lesser forms of connection, I argue that distance is not the opposite of presence, absence is. It is in that productive difference that I look at what forms of intimacy are possible, whether violent forms or forms for care, or forms of care that produce or reinscribe intimate violence. I'm far from the first person, of course, to think specifically about the genres of cathexis and attachment produced in technologically mediated intimacy, whether on the grounds of mass intimacy or what it's like to be quote unquote alone with an algorithm intimately in my case, all of which is licensed under the sign of therapeutic care. There is a great deal of anxiety about how technologized life denatures intimacy between humans. The human who has forsaken intimacy in favor of say their phone and this image and versions of it uh, circulate wild, widely and I guess wildly in think pieces and hot takes and so forth. Others, myself included, argue instead that relating over distance does not create, uh, does create new forms of relationships that are not necessarily uh, against the human, or as Anna Ward calls this, intimatics, or quote, a relation of intimacy generated from, not in spite of, the accessibility and transmissibility afforded by contemporary technologies, end quote. From Lacan's theory of extimacy, uh, which is that there can be something intimate and familiar about what's held at distance or quote, the opposition between inside and outside, between container and contained, end quote. To Donald Horton uh, and Richard Wall's groundbreaking work on the parasocial phenomenon uh, engendered by intimacy at, the dis at distance in the 1950s, or to the Goldwater debates about diagnosing someone at distance, to our present where teletherapy and therapy are co coincidental terms, for almost all clinicians and their patients. Relating intimately is a pharmacon. It's both the illness and the cure for what ails. But there is less critical exploration of techno intimacy, how technologies acquire familiarity under this sign of good relations while licensing forms of violence and how humans live in the wake of such experience. 
This too is part of the story of AI machine learning as it's brought into digital health scenarios, including teletherapy. So returning to the three scales at which intimacy occurs with which I opened, the group, the pair, and the individual, all three are made use of, configured, and convened in teletherapy. But it's the first and the last that are mind, minded, and managed by intimate AI and intimate algorithms for care. Groups are made familiar to and by algorithmic systems for care. Uh, if we have much experience, and many of us probably do, with coercive intimacy and non-consensual intimacy and the internet of things, whether that's smart homes that are now used uh, you know, in a multiplicity of ways, including as tools for domestic violence or facial emotion recognition or predictive algorithms for policing and sentencing. We also have examples of this kind of coercive intimacy in mental health care from the algorithm that determines whether or not a patient suddenly called a user is quote unquote fit for care or that algorithm that determines that it's time to alert the police uh, to a particular person in crisis. This occurs both at the level of the group that's being watched and uh, the process of datification, where data are ostensibly anonymized but can quickly become repopulated with identifying features. And it happens at the level of the individual person as they navigate, say, medical redlining and the insurance system or systemic violence in the interrelated total institutions of psychiatry and cultural uh, and carceral logics. Therapeutic laborers too are made intimate with these platforms in the sort of sense of being forced to be familiar. As Elizabeth Cotton has argued, we're now in a moment of the gigification and uberization of therapy uh, where this increasingly feminized form of labor is in what is often experienced as a break from tradition, though it might not be, uh, is increasingly monitored for various forms of productivity itself. These forms of monitoring, prediction, and actionable investigation are intimate, whether we are aligned with the therapist or the would-be patient or both. Our watchers have intimacy with us, again, however monstrously. Their function is to render us familiar. On the opposite end of the scale, but operating continuously, are forms of intimate care provided by algorithm that seemingly have deleted out the acting expert, uh, such that the user becomes the subject and object of care at once. These apps and their much longer history, starting with you know, the very famous Joseph Weizenbaum's ELISA project at uh, MIT, are frequently licensed under a democratizing logic that prizes access to care making the method of care delivery not an other-oriented intimacy, but an intimacy with the self, a form of self-management and a turn to appropriation uh, of notions of self-care and in our moment often flown uh, under the sign of wellness. And Gabriella, I hope we can talk more about what is a proper form of self-management and what's excluded therein uh, from your talk in the Q&A. Um, these programs, whether for depression or anxiety, um, also most commonly alcoholism and disordered eating, aim to bracket the need for other oriented intimacies by allowing a self intimacy to replace it. These co programs code in autonomy, but how does that automated autonomy function and what is it doing to the patient we now call user? While a machine listens and a digital interface provides the therapeutic setting and experience, the only explicit human involved in those one-to-one uh, -one interactions is now the doctorless patient. In algorithmic therapies, which produce a closed circuit of self, automation takes on the role of the computational other, or what Neda Atonsky and Kalindi Vora call surrogate humans. I call what happens in this circuit between human and computational other auto intimacy. The auto here is doing double work. Uh, it's the auto of the self, but also the auto of automation. The two combine together in this circuit. I take auto intimacy to be a state in which one uh, develops a capacity uh, to be with oneself through the medium of the non-human, both the piece of hardware and the code that it's running with the aim of self-knowing and capacity of self much like one may come to better know oneself by writing in a diary, tracking oneself, and so on. Unlike human therapists, 
who ostensibly provide more than just an embodied receptacle and place of storage for the speech of their patients. Automated and algorithmic based therapies listen or read solely in order to respond. They can't not, they can't help it. They listen by a variety of mechanisms depending on what the object is, including retrieval based decision trees, uh, automatic scripts, and paralinguistic vocal monitoring. They offer outputs following inputs, regulated by a governing body of rules and decisions. Yet algorithmic therapies also rely on a most intimate computing in which a rich set of relationships is present between the user and the therapeutic apparatus, even if they're only fantastically present. Or as I argue, they rely on auto intimacy. In the case of computer-based therapies, it's a specific, specifically therapeutic relationship to the self, and again, not another, that is mediated by the program and its processes. Historically, auto-intimacy uh, in the service of therapy is driven by the desire to automate treatment and then increase consistent engagement with that treatment via enjoyment and gamification, so that in the absence of relational intimacy, the auto-intimate patient will be driven towards compliance with the treatment nonetheless. So I'll just quickly uh, walk us through a few examples to give us some ground uh, for conversation, hopefully. Uh, many of these apps operate under the sign of not therapy while purporting to offer something akin to therapy. They might do this for a variety of reasons, to skirt FDA approval, to uh, get away from liability standards that therapeutic interactions are held to, and to sh shy away from efficacy claims or, or a particular set of efficacy claims. Um, this is one location where expedient intimacy for care comes on the scene. As just a few examples, Ellie here on the screen will diagnose depression and anxiety in returning veterans. Uh, she's a, she is a diagnostic system contained within an avatar of an ambiguously raced professional woman sitting in what is very clearly a large therapist chair. She, quote unquote, she seems confident uh, but approachable, awaiting the magic of intimacy to begin. When one user says he's from LA, uh, Ellie will respond, oh, I'm from LA myself. And she is because she is housed at USC uh, and funded by DARPA. Behind this early attempt at a therapeutic alliance or perhaps joining, Ellie is already performing a deep analysis on her user. So uh, conversational intimacy covers over the production of a different form of intimacy. Uh, the, the bot is equipped with sensors and a webcam that detect the affect in speech, postures, and gestures. And she can perform facial expression recognition and sentiment analysis of the content of users' words which she'll then again compare both to a control civilian database and that of the military, all of which will provide Ellie with feedback that will allow her to estimate the prevalence of, say, in the case of this user, depression. So Ellie will take normative understandings of vocalization uh, and speech uh, using markers that produce these normative and pathological subjects. Uh, the, the understandings are, are always quite ableist, um, right? The idea that only a certain kind of speech indicates a certain kind of well being. Uh, Ellie counts every single instance of this kind of uh, indicator as a quantifying intimacy. Uh, and then she turns it into a diagnostic tool for judgment, a form of actionable intimacy. Uh, as another example, and one many New Yorkers may be uh, uh, familiar with from subways uh, back when we used to take them. Uh, Joyable is a concierge digital mental health service uh, that combines a 60 second quiz to generate a complete emotional profile of its user. This is again a form of quantified intimacy. It will then lead into a five set of five minute automated cognitive activities and human quote unquote coaching as opposed to therapy. Joyable, a state turned into an activity in its own grammar, uh, an action before it's a state. Joyable is sold not to individuals who seek mental health care, but to corporations who will pay for it and include it in their employees' benefit packages. The advertising is therefore targeted to companies with the tagline, quote, happier employees, better outcomes, creating an intimate loop between therapeutic data, employer, and employee. Outcomes here is both the therapeutic outcome and the economic outcome. Wellness and production will collapse under the sign of therapeutic care and intimacy with the self. 
Joyable addresses itself to the emotional crisis that labor is and always is. We're addressing it just enough so that optimal labor can continue. And lastly, just another example, Replica. Here also on the screen, Replica has grown in popularity extensively in the pandemic, uh, perhaps because it asserts its use as a companion or a mental health friend. Uh, the avatar here, a woman with a bob uh, and pink hair, uh, is infinitely customizable and therefore kind of ongoingly pleasurable to use. Uh, many different elements of replica, which starts as an egg and then grows into an avatar, um, increase the stickiness of care. That is, again, not stigmatized as therapy, um, but instead deployed to stem the tide of alienation, which we societally figure as loneliness. So returning to Fred Moden's notion of friendship, this intimate computing neither anticipates nor survives individuation for it is only a tool for automating autonomy. The controllable companion is a form of auto intimacy. And intimate AI is as old as AI itself. The promise of techno intimacy is that it may allow those excluded from traditional arrangements for care and uh, relation to be refolded into systems systems in which we experience care. The opposite actually is what holds. AI and machine learning based care interventions too frequently embed and recodify race and gender, whether in the feminization of these robots uh, as surrogate humans or in care scenarios, or in the deployment of algorithms that foster the conditions of medical redlining and the flourishing of white supremacy across these systems. While this refolding of the excluded following Ruha Benjamin and Daniel Glabau does take place, it can be in the service of extraction, datification, capture, and control. I didn't think it would turn out this way, quote, is the secret epitaph of intimacy, end quote, writes Lauren Berlant. It may also be the secret epitaph of technology, a redundant epitaph for techno intimacies, except of course, we have and could have predicted it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Hannah, for this, and Gabriella to you as well. And great, um, great kicker, Hannah. That was that was a, a great last sentence. Uh, this was such there was such richness in both of these. I have a ton of notes and post its, but I want to pull out a few. And just a reminder to the audience: please um, keep putting your questions in the Q and A as I, as we will. Um, shift um, to bringing you guys in in just a moment. Um, but just kind of gathering my thoughts. Um, I heard, uh, Gabriella, you start off with by saying, well, I want to confront my fear. This is how I explore intimacy. And, and, and that seems to be very much grounded um, in the human body. I heard relationships with the environment that are then also mediated through technology or purposefully mediated through technology uh, and was really struck by your first provocation asking what happens if we put intimacy um, first. What I kind of saw connecting very much to Hannah's um, piece was also the question of autonomy, which is I think maybe a topic we may want to explore in our conversation. Um, but Hannah, you said something that I wrote down as you said it, because it really struck me, was that our watchers have intimacy with us, which actually reminded me of the movie, um, The Life of Others, if you haven't seen it. Um, it's about a Stasi officer in East, East Berlin who develops intimacy with um, the people he observes without actually really interacting with them. Um, and so you also both spoke about coerced trust and consent and how this is kind of folded into tech innovation in different kinds of ways and how this can actually then you know become uh really or is, is deployed in service of you know what Shoshana Zuboff calls um surveillance capitalism and we can explore and you have explored this further how this is um essentially automated oppression so I would love to to stick with that for a moment and, and ask you both um, if our watchers have intimacy with us and if we are really looking at, um, at this, there's this intimacy, but then also as you observe, there is the fact that intimacy doesn't mean trust or consent. And we have this accelerated 
narrative of innovate, tech innovation, right? Not even necessarily actual innovation. Um, how can we square that with where things should go? Uh, and Gabrielle, I'm going to ask you first. Uh, I'm going to ask you your own question. What what happens um, if we put intimacy first? If intimacy also is this problematic thing, as Hannah observed. Oh, wow, that's a heavy one. Um, I think. You know, we will, we all come from this kind of world where jargon is used to separate and, and to become inaccessible. And I think something that I've really learned in the project um, in Decoding Stigma is how important demystification is part of the intimacy project. How do we allow people to use technologic, tech, like technology in order to explore themselves and their place in society as opposed to only having it put in the hands of those that have this guardianship over it. You know, like it's, it's put within this realm of like the, the, the great man mythology and, and the Silicon Valley ideology. Um, and that has figured out how to kind of gatekeep around these explorations that has put a gatekeep, but maybe more like watchtower uh, to come back to you, Mona, uh, to be able to build and become above and look down on society where I think that there is a lot of um, opportunity for within the hands of like grassroots or of those that are actually really trying to understand the complexities of intimacy, relation relational and otherwise um, could actually explode what it means to, for self-discovery, for empathy um, uh, within our own conversations and, and, and contexts, um, and not be simply informed by stratification through datification, um, and not be um, like, like, I wonder what um, AI could have been like if instead like currently we're in a model of like, it is being deployed in order to um, make people shop more at the very base minimum, right? To turn people into, into products for advertisers. What if instead we had started training AI on how to grow food better? Like just how could it have been different if at the, the seed of where we are right now was more toward generative, um, relationships with the environment, with each other, rather than capitalism and buying and uh, production and industrialism. Hannah, do you want to jump right in here? Yes, I want to live there. Um, yeah, I, I see very, I mean, so much of this now, even though not all of these companies are Silicon Valley, right? They, they are the traditional uh, history of either industry and military joining DARPA, USC, um, and academia playing a, a major role there, or they are Silicon Valley companies, or they're in related uh, zones in New York. There are, you know, I always think about the, the deep long-term um, activist histories of teletherapy, which drew me to working on it in the first place, where teletherapy would almost always try to rescind at least some coordinates of capital like money, um, or make it free, uh, rescind other elements like training, um, not make it a free for all, but get rid of expertise and allow people to relate intimately um, over telephone wire. Uh, allow for calls to be placed. And that many of the um, say suicide hotlines or rape crisis hotlines that do this work now are, are dealing with and fielding attention between wanting to serve better via data um, and uh, what that datification often means, which is recourse to policing. And so I'm trying to, you know, I just in general, <laughs> am against that for myriad reasons, um, but thinking about the ways to not walk backwards, but to preserve and carve out spaces where it can be um, one non-institution without us immediately going to carceral logics for care. Um, 
And that remains sort of the, the question, especially as these spaces that have existed and preserved themselves at the limit of where that's possible um, are often finding that very difficult uh, because of legality uh, and liability pressures, um, as well as the drive to quantify everything, including the, you know, the trigger word for, for when to call the cops. Um, Gabriella's answer uh, is a beautiful speculative future, though, so I want to join with that. Thanks for that, um, both of you. Um, we have a, a fair bit of questions, but before I launch into that, I want to um, really ask, because there's so many connecting points still, if there were any points in each other's presentations that you wanted to respond to, I can think of one that I'm really interested in, but I want to give you the opportunity to um, talk to one another. I I have a, a question, and of course, if it doesn't appeal to you, and there are so many from the audience, it's uh, such a privilege to cut the queue. Um, about and I have my my notes app open, that's why I'm looking down. But just you know, you you gave this beautiful and persuasive account of how sex is the substrate upon which telecoms have lived and been built. And there are just so many examples, rich examples uh, in the US context, elsewhere, et cetera. And then you also started by saying that sex is excluded from self-development culture. And of course, uh, you know, the long and uh, pervasive history of horophobia uh, makes one understand immediately that reach. But I was wondering if there is anything else that you could help us think about for why sex is so deeply bracketed from self-care, even in its most quote unquote neoliberal horror show, um, and and how you see how we can get it back, you know, like how we could pull sexuality back in um, and sex as pleasure back in. I think that's a question I'm constantly grappling with. Um, and even thinking about ideas around stigma, you know, right now, much of the reason is because it is stigmatized. But I I'm trying to encapsulate the conversation in that stigma itself is not inherently negative, but it's the weaponization of stigma that is actually very destructive. So, you know, there are things that I like to do because they're naughty, right? Um, but the fact that that can turn into a criminal activity is what makes it dangerous to individuals. So, I think it's really a conversation about how we can accept that there are just things that we may not like in behavior, um, but don't necessarily actually harm anyone who's autonomously and consentingly participating that should not inform criminality um, or policing. And if we can work that conversation, I think that we can have a more open discussion about the recuperation of sexuality as an autonomous exploration um, of bodily autonomy, of um, resuscitating biopower as something that's individually um, expressed rather than something that's um, a sort of weapon of the state. Um, does that answer your question? <laughs> um, so I, yeah, I will return. Um, this intersection, this, this beautiful explosion of intimacy as defined not necessarily uh, as inherently um, positive is, is, is something that's just very eye-opening to me in a way. Um, and it reminds me a lot about the reframing of the erotic and in Audre Lorde's work in, in discussing how uh, the erotic has been confused as, as they say with the trivial, the psychotic, the plasticized sensation. So how did you come to explore this redefinition of something that has you know, been assumed to mean um, care? Thank you. Um, well, like care and like empathy, I think that um, in my work, I'm interested in thinking about what's the moral good held at the level of sort of particular society and what work that does to cover over what's actually occurring 
at small and then larger scales. Um, so, right, your work on radical empathy, right, empathy is another term that in general taught to uh, children, be empathetic, share your toys, and so on, and it starts to become ingrained as a moral good, and as does care. And then we can think also, though, about what real deep structural violence uh, at the individual and, and pair and, and uh, more global level has been carried out under those signs. And then maybe we can start, and this is my hope, we can start to see um, when we're being sold, say, care, but actually maybe not. Uh, and we can begin to parse what might be, yeah, as I said, concealed and carried by the word intimacy or the feeling of intimacy when you know one of the original meetings, not to, not to sound like too theoretical, is to be you know made familiar. Like that kind of forcedness is always there in the word, but we choose not necessarily to engage it. And so that that's a strain in my work because right that's true in all therapeutic interactions. Right that there is this possibility for kind of real uh, radical shift in intersubjectivity and also something else. Um, and uh, being able to hold them both together at the same time has been crucial to me. It's a lovely question. Thank you. Thank you so much both. Um, I'm gonna um, shift into the Q&A uh, section now because we have a bunch of questions and I'm just gonna start with the first one because it's for Gabri Gabriella and it, it's like your turn now. Could you share more about your perspective on content moderation? What could, um, art as, and activism, or cut, what could we do as art and activism to build generative organizing frameworks that challenge the common paradigm? Very, very hands on. Yeah, uh, content moderation really is the conversation of the day right now. Um, and I think it comes out of ideas of platform determinism and how we kind of turned a cur like we turned, a, we rounded a corner from this uh, idea of the internet being a place for discovery and, and uh, new communities toward um, how many people can we get to use our platform so we could sell their data. And, and with that has become uh, a definition, like the need to have universal definitions of harm. Um, and so I don't know if we're really within the answer, if we're going to look at uh, places like Facebook or Instagram, like may, I think it's because of the centralization of communication that content moderation has to become broader and broader, or like the definitions of harm within the content moderation conversation have to become broader and broader. But there is never going to be a way for something that I feel harms me to be exactly the same as something that somebody in, you know, uh, from like the subaltern universe thinks harms them and to flatten um, these definitions I think is kind of the big issue so I'm looking forward to conversations around decentralizing um, communication platforms um, the next meeting that we're having we're going to be featuring Jin Jin uh, who's currently at iBeam as a rapid response fellow and they are going to be presenting um, here I'll drop the link actually because this might be useful, um, or maybe not, I'm not sure if I can. Um, but they're gonna be presenting TogetherNet, which is an open source communication software. Uh, and it's designed around ethos of transparency and consent. Um, and it's made for decentralized communication to occur and it's peer to peer. So what does it mean when we take the power of uh, communications technology and apply it on a peer to peer level, as opposed to um, a centralized um, platform level? Apropos um, centralization or decentralization and definitions, which I think have so much to do with power. I have a question for Hannah. Um, we know that the normalization of the care subject or care subject carries a problematic baggage, but how to design new forms of intimacy without that nostalgic parameter? 
This is such a wonderful and productive question, but I think, in fact, you have the wrong person in front of you and that I don't work on these designs, but you know, Shaw and Barsdell, right, and thinking about designing for a utopian feminist future, uh, there are forms of radical care that reject this nostalgic parameter. We've seen this in, in the re-remembering of mutual aid that has existed long before the COVID-19 moment uh, as they've moved online and off. Um, you know, people like Rashad Newsom, who's making a, a specific AI therapist for uh, the New York Black community. I think there are these places that where people who do do that work, design work, are pushing right back uh, at the sort of flattened notion of care as purely loving for everyone, care as a nostalgic universalizer, for sure. Uh, and they would be that group of people, a dream panel to hear from. Um, and so all I can do is, is point to their work and I'd be happy to throw some links in the chat. It's a beautiful question. Thank you, Hannah. Um, I really appreciate that. I wanna um, just for a moment, stay with the design question partially because that's also the focus of my work. And I'm gonna ask a, another question to Gabriella. And we have somebody who said, I'm a fan of Susan Kite's work on how different ontologies create different technologies um, and different AI results. What do you think would a sex worker-led AI initiative look like? Very concrete. Yeah, um, especially it's, it's interesting considering, thank you for uh, that question. Um, and considering that AI is also recursive in its, its education is a very um, deep, uh, no pun intended, uh, question to ask. Um, but when I think about how design spaces that have sex workers in them speak, they talk about consent. Um, they talk about how do we be open enough to be inclusive but exclusive enough to keep people safe? Um, what do models of verification look like? How do, I how do I know that the person who's talking to me is the person I'm talking to yet? How is there space for multiple identities? How can I be like, how can I be the, you know, um, the person who's working in a quasi-legal uh, space while also, um, you know, as we found out a couple months ago, for instance, the um, the nurse who was on OnlyFans, right? Like, and uh, we live in a current society where the New York Post decided that that was newsworthy. Um, so how do we create a place that keeps her identity safe in one place, but allows her to mo move through the space as another? Um, so I just think it's, it's based on questions of um, just deeply it's of protection, of protecting each other, of, um, you know, we like discussions around digital hygiene are a public health um, question. Like when I have good digital hygiene, I keep all those around me safe online. Um, so those are kind of the questions that I think would inform a sex worker ontology um, in the AI space. Thank you so much for that, Gabrielle. And that's probably for another conversation, but I wonder how we can bring this into conversations um, that focus on unionizing and sort of, um, you know, worker movements that we're seeing also um, in the tech sector, interestingly, uh, in lots of conversations on solidarity across you know, industries, but also class lines um, that are sort of really, you know, solidarity as the glue. Um, Hannah, question for you, and we're going to stay with AI for a moment. Um, how does Replica and other AI or avatar companion producers control and or mediate the data of the user in order to customize the companion. How do you see privacy marshaled as something to be sacrificed for better intimacy? Oh, okay. Um, so uh, Replica uh, and other AI avatar companion producers, um, you can Google this. <laughs> uh, so Google, for instance, has WISA. 
It's a very cute blue penguin. And Wysa the penguin is doing the work of the avatar and is not customizable, but instead the sort of conversation, right, which comes off these huge data sets um, is what is particular to the user. And that is, is billed as a mental health companion animal Wysa. Uh, I bring this up to say that Wysa then will sort of suggest, nudge, uh, and all these other terms we're familiar with in the AI space, that actually you should be working with a human and it, it for towards a cognitive behavioral therapy intervention if you sort of max out a certain kind of level of care that Wysa the penguin avatar can provide you uh, without human oversight. And that that is very um, common in the space of AI first and then human, where there's a pairing. Whereas replica, so now to come to your question, really is bracketed away from mental health intervention therapeutic space by running this idea of just running conversation. That the problem, one of the deepest problems in society might be something like loneliness. And that instead of, um, seeking out a therapist where there will be stigma, you could just talk to a friend. And so again, the data sets are much more um, on the linguistic side. The customization is like playing Sims. Um, and you know, whoever your avatar is, is uh, as protected as any other element, which is to say, I don't know, because all of this is proprietary. But it's not um, the sort of the, the screen element of the AI companion uh, is what sort of is part of that stickiness and that trap, the kind of Nick Seaver, right? That will induce you to keep the conversation going and begin the play. And I think what Replica hopes is that you come back because of its recursive learning structure where um, your Replica knows how to care for you a little bit better each day, uh, including, and I didn't mention this, but I'll take the opportunity that Replica texts you in your text messages. So you don't only have to go through an app, it's also as if it's your friend, like saying, hey, I miss you and nudge you. Um, so that's the first part. And how do I see privacy marshaled as something to be sacrificed for better intimacy? Um, we see this all the time, not so much under the sign of intimacy, but care. In order to care for you better, we need everything you've got, data. Um, and that's where that slippage tends to happen. And you can go play with these things, Replica and so on. They're all for free online if you're interested. Same as Eliza. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Hannah. And that, yeah, I mean, the, the medical field, that finding the narrative in the medical field, especially now in the pandemic, is, you know, a really interesting activity. I'm going to uh, stay with you just for a moment, Hannah, because we have a follow up question. Uh, about the cases that you showed or the examples that you showed. And we have somebody who asked, have they run into problems with people who have mental disorders that cause their behavior not to be consistent with what the AI has been trained to recognize, Ooh, the messiness of the human? Yeah, in my understanding where that where, <laughs> where that's detected, which is the only time I would, it would become rising to the level where I would learn about it, um, that's when, in general, users are users again, right? Patients are redirected away from these services. Uh, so it doesn't have to just be as kind of, uh, I, I don't remember how you put it, but some kind of difference from uh, the mode in which the app was hoping to engage. But it can be, right? Um, something as simple as someone's age. If you're under 18, you're not welcome. Or if you're sexually assaulted in the process of using one of these apps, you have now violated the terms of agreement and need to leave and find some other quote unquote higher level of care. That's always what it's called um, and, and so on. And so there are many moments where uh, if you're not, if your mind is not engaging the app in the way it's supposed to be, you are redirected, AKA booted off the platform all the time, yeah. It's interesting how the sort of drawing boundaries happens, right? We talked a little bit about boundaries earlier. Um, I have a, yeah, about, yeah. Um, question for both of you, but I would love to start with Gabriela. Um, I'm wondering what the speakers think about the political economic context that structures their sites of interest in theoretical intervention, sex work and telehealth. That is what political and or economic 
problems does policing digital intimacy or shifting toward telehealth solve for society at large and according to whom? Gabriella. Another big one. This is a great audience. Um, so thank you to the audience for being so um, just so engaged. Um, I think uh, this is a really like right. Hmm. Oof. <laughs> um, autonomy is uh, something that seems to be policed in a number of fashions, especially with, with the body. It's, it's migration, um, it's borders, um, it's uh, economic privilege, who gets to access certain um, legal resources, medical resources. Um, so it's sort of within the context of leave me alone, uh, if I can say it so politely in that like, uh, how do we create a system that does not necessarily look toward punishment? Um, and this goes back to Ruha Benjamin, as um, Hannah has quoted a couple of times. And how do we actually look at the imaginary of um, a multi, like a, a pluralversal thinking of a recognition that our neighbors may not have the same type of thinking as we do? But that's okay. Um, how do we do this outside of the way, uh, the dirty word of libertarianism that has been sort of sullied and become this kind of uh, ideology of like, um, I don't know, just uh, another form of, uh, you know, cis hetero white privilege um, and understanding that collectivism doesn't. If, if, it doesn't, if it doesn't look familiar, it doesn't mean it's unsafe. Um, and so that's kind of within the context that I'm taking these questions. Um, the unfamiliar does not necessarily mean unsafe. Um, I don't know how that exists within a, a, goal, a global economic structure. Um, I don't know if it can, but I think I'd prefer to dream about it and, and try rather than accept it as um, impossible. Thank you so much, Gabriella. And I was struck by how you brought in, by how you brought in safety again, and sort of, you know, the um, kind of made the point that safety is something that we experience individually, but also collectively, and that it means something different for different communities, which is, I think, something we can, we all can now more relate to after a year off being um, in a pandemic. Um, and I think there are really interesting conversations to be had about that. But um, Hannah, same question. Do you, should I repeat real quick? You, are you good? The problems uh, that telehealth purports to solve uh, according to yeah. him. Yeah. Um, so telehealth, and, and again, I work really primarily on teletherapy, but you know, know what's up with telemedicine and digital health interventions too, but to a different degree. Um, you know, in general, the sort of blockbuster uh, taglines are always about democratization um, or this group has been denied access historically. Um, let's uh, incorporate or bring in for screening, for diagnosis, uh, for some form of care. Um, and that can happen at the very uh, local level. And in fact, often the best telemedicine or telehealth projects are at the local level and they're led by their communities who are working on health infrastructures um, and radically upending questions of expertise and who is the doctor or who is the therapist and who is the patient. But at, I assume with telehealth, the more corporate level, uh, that tends to be the banner. And then of course, uh, and this is the, the Benjamin move, right? Um, that that transcendence, uh, that's her word, is not really possible. Um, and so the problem that's being solved uh, for society at large is actually just tanking the cost of care, uh, rerouting care, um, the gigification of care, uh, Prop 22 uh, will pertain well to therapists shortly, I'm sure, uh, who use these platforms and so on. Um, so 
there may be uh, an increase in certain forms of care's availability, but are they good is a whole other question uh, that's not typically answered by this just like access. Um, and access, which is again a typically a, a flattened access, not a rich and complicated one that we might all dream about. Thank you so much, Hannah, for that um, for that point. We have a last question from the audience, and then I have one as well. Um, what are your thoughts on parasocial relationships, and how does it does that fit with the intimacy or distance intimacy? model. Um, I think that's for both, but Hannah probably let's hear from you first. Thanks. Uh, I just would encourage, uh, I think a lot about parasocial relationships from the work of John Durham Peters on broadcasting and schizophrenia. So just that article is fantastic. Um, in my book, I talk a lot about what the radio is doing, um, a sort of classic site of uh, parasocial relationship like television. Um, and, uh, you know, so what, how do we relate to Esther Perel? Is Esther Perel everyone's therapist when we're listening to the podcast? Uh, was that true in the 1940s and 50s with D.W. Winnicott? Uh, what are the kinds of relationality and intimacy instructed therein? I also just want to say, just in case they're watching, um, my student Yvonne Gonzalez in uh, literature of social media is working on uh, parasocial relationships in TikTok and DMs and the kind of boundaries. Um, all of this would be interesting to have uh, Gabriella uh, in conversation with, but uh, Yvonne Gonzalez will be someone whose thoughts on parasocial relationships I will be looking out for too. Gabriella, please, parasocial relationships. <laughs> I could not answer it better than Hannah, and I'm so interested in your students' work. Um, but it is interesting because, you know, there is this performative reality, um, but it feels like kind of an exacerbation of the sort of um, even just assumptive identities that we place on people that are in our lives. Um, and the sort of, you know, people that we have in our heads or the versions of people that we have in our heads, you know, the, the, the father that you have to kill um, in Nietzschean terms and whatnot. And so I think it's honestly just an explosion of things that we encounter on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, who is the teacher that is judging the projects that we are doing, but they're not really there? Um, who is the, the friend who is judging my current encounter with X, Y, and Z person, person in, in my space, but it's not really there. Um, so honestly, I just think that we're able to explore it further because we have this less, uh, we have a uh, more media facilitated version of it in that we have, okay, celebrity culture that we can see through Instagram or podcast culture where we're like, you know, like screaming, yes, um, at what they said on, <laughs> like on the podcast in the car. Um, but that really is just kind of an explode, like a, a, a more visceral um, version of what we've already, like what mediates our experience every day. Thank you so much. I'm gonna take Chair's privilege and ask the last question. Um, we've been hearing and talking about self-care and self-management and we've heard about how these are not the same thing and I started off or I opened this event by talking about the unpaid care work um, that is unevenly distributed across society um, and that sort of really plays a more prominent role at the moment and so I'm going to ask a pop culture question uh, to both of you which is you know from a grounding in your research and your activism and your own social practices, what are practices of self-care that you've learned about over the past year that are um, really interesting or that you um, um, would recommend for other people to explore? Gabriella. Oh, wow. Um, well, I really, 
have loved recursive feedback loops. I am the product of just recursive, like biofeedback um, and do, a, I, it's just been my jam for a very long time. Um, I mean, you know what? I can't recommend baths enough. <laughs> I'm gonna keep it really simple. Um, and I also have found, you know, in this like parasocial way of like, since I can't be around people, uh, believing in this sort of like being the uh, sum of the, you know, five people you spend the most time with, like really trying to have a parasocial relationship with like five uh, distant teachers in a way and, and learning from their paths and, and not necessarily looking into like self-help section, but like, um, like who, who do I sense as outspoken or who do I sense as um, really being protective of their boundaries and kind of uh, trying to consume as much culture from them in order to replicate what I like, what my beliefs of their persona are, even if they might not necessarily be true. Thank you so much for sharing that. I appreciate it. Hannah, say, same pop culture question. Oh man. Um, <laughs> different modes of communication with, with dear ones uh, who are far away. So um, a cousin and separate person who's also my dear friend, but another friend who used voice memos, um, which you know I noticed gives me a certain kind of anxiety, but learning about what the sort of affordances of having their voice without the synchronous phone call. Um, going back to the old school email, a little bit longer, a little so slower to respond. Um, and I have had a very strange thing, which is I'm reading novels again for the first time in seven or eight years at a fair clip. And so um, I think maybe we're post the novel and yet that's when I've returned to it. Um, but uh, looking at, at other sort of um, offline, but virtual reality has been a, a solve for me. Uh, but I don't know that these self-care works would work for any other self. Thank you so much both. Um, I really appreciate so much the wisdom and insight and energy that you have brought into this virtual space today. Thank you so much for sharing your work on technology and intimacy. Gabriela Garcia and Hannah Zavin. Gabriela Garcia can be found on Twitter under Stabby Gabby, I believe, and Hannah is out there as well under H. Zevin. Please follow their amazing work. Hannah has a book coming out in August, The Distant Cure with MIT Press. Gabriella has tons of things going on as you've, you've seen. Um, my gratitude to all of you as well, um, to our wonderful audience, Team IPK, 370J Street Project, and the NYU Center for Responsible AI. We will be back soon with Co-opting AI Earth, hopefully on Earth Day. And um, have a wonderful evening, everybody, and I hope to see you soon. Stay safe and well. <laughs>